to greet you at the 2020 Toronto Annual Ukrainian Famine Lecture. Of course, the lecture is being delivered in a new way in this age of COVID and Zoom and uh, to an audience, I assume, in which many are not from Toronto and part of our usual public. Uh, I am Frank Sisson director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, University of Alberta, and head of the executive committee of the Holdemore Research and Educational Consortium, uh, which we usually refer to as HREC. Uh, HREC has in this past year uh, had to branch out in new ways in order to carry on its work. Uh, for those of you who have not recently looked at uh, our website, uh, I urge you to look at www.holodemore.ca uh, and you will find uh, many new research materials added and of particular, particular interest, uh, a directory of, of photographs, authentic photographs, from the Holodomor of 1932-33. Uh, other ways in which HREC has adapted is that we now have a very active uh, seminar workshop of young scholars who are involved in doing Holodomor research, who from throughout the world internationally now gather. Uh, and so in a certain way, circumstances have forced us to think in new ways and ways in which uh, we will, I think, effectively continue our work. And I think uh, many of you may have seen uh, Val Valentina Corelliu's lecture yesterday uh, on uh, education and pedagogy uh, and the Voldemort. We will have a number of events coming up in the next uh, two weeks. And I particularly urge you to look at our website or the CIUS website uh, for two, I think, outstanding events. One will be a showing of the film Hunger for Truth. That is a film on Rhea Kleiman, the Toronto journalist who first wrote about the, the Hello de Moor. That'll be on Sunday, the 22nd of November, 1.30 to 3 o'clock Mountain Time. And then uh, there will be a talk by Anne Applebaum on her book, Red Famine, uh, a book uh, which has uh, taken to a very wide public knowledge of the Ukrainian Holodomor. That will occur as part of the Edmonton Famine Holodomor commemoration on Saturday, the 28th of November, 1.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I assume that all of you are getting, getting used to converting Mountain Standard Time. Uh, we will today uh, uh, have first a lecture by Doc, Dr. Bogdan Kleed. Uh, those of you who would like to pose questions, please look at the tab for Q&A window and write your questions. And the executive director of HREC, Martha Baziuk, will later conduct uh, uh, the posing of these questions to Dr. Kleed. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Bogdan Kleed, uh, our longtime head of research 
uh, at uh, the Voldemort Research and Educational Consortium. Uh, indeed, Dr. Cleed was for over 25 years uh, an administrator at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, serving as assistant director uh, during that time. Uh, his original research career was on the 19th century. Indeed, he worked with Ivan Lesyakrudnitsky, uh, one of the greatest historians uh, of modern Ukrainian history, uh, uh, in working on a dissertation on Volodymyr Antonovich, and a very important figure for Ukrainian historical studies and the Ukrainian movement of the 19th century. Uh, but uh, Dr. Kleed always had a deep interest in uh, the Holodomor. Uh, and uh, parallel to his administrative work, had already begun working on it, and indeed worked with Alexander Motil of Rutgers University uh, uh, in composing the Holodomor Reader, a source book on the famine of 1932-1933 in Ukraine, which appeared in 2012. Uh, this uh, was very fortuitous for the foundation of HREC uh, in uh, uh, 2013, uh, in that it already gave a major publication in the field. Uh, it therefore is a, a work which many of you have turned to in both teaching and reading on the whole of the more. Uh, he has written on Ukrainian contemporary popular music, politics, and national culture. He also writes, continues to write on the 19th century. But of late, in his concentration on the uh, Holodomor, uh, he has worked on editing a collection on colonialism and famine in historical context that is scheduled to be published as a first issue of the online journal, East-West Journal of Ukrainian Studies in March of 2021. Uh, in addition, uh, those of you who go to our website will see that there are a number of articles of translations of Ukrainian scholars uh, who have written on the, whole, on the whole of the more, and these will be published as a book that Bogdan is editing uh, together with our researcher, Oksana Vinnik. Uh, he also was deeply interested in the black deeds of the Kremlin and has done some very interesting research uh, in that field. So as it is, I think, quite fitting that we have invited him to be our 2020 uh, Holodomor lecturer, a lecture that is sponsored by REC, by the Petro Yatsik program uh, for uh, Ukrainian research at Ceres uh, at the Monk Center by the Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies and by the Canadian Ukrainian Congress Toronto branch. As always, we are grateful to the Temerte Foundation, uh, which makes possible the funding of the work of REC. And I might add, uh, uh, we bring the good news that that funding will continue for the next four years. Today, uh, Dr. Cleed will be addressing us on The Last Stand, the third all-Ukrainian conference of the Communist Party Bolsheviks of Ukraine and the Holodomor. Dr. Cleed. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. And um, although I can't see the audience in front of me, um, welcome to the lecture and thank you for um, attending online. I wish uh, we were all able to um, be together in one room. Um, I want to begin tonight's lecture with some questions. Why study what was said at this particular conference and what was taking place in the months leading up to it? Uh, this lecture is in part about policies and decisions taken by the Soviet central leadership in the Kremlin and their translation and reception by national or republic level and local level officials in the Communist Party of Ukraine about relations between the leadership in the center in Moscow and regional leaders in the subcenter in Kharkiv. In this relationship, the Kremlin's top leadership expected that 
subordinate party members and officials willingly implement their directives. <clears throat> In brief events and developments leading up to the conference, what occurred just prior to and what was said at the conference itself and what took place in its immediate aftermath reveal quite a bit about the nature of these relations. We know that Joseph Stalin and his inner circle bear the greatest responsibility for the famine in Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union. However, the Communist Party of Ukraine, its leadership at the Republic level, bear part of that responsibility as well. To what degree and in what way did they contribute to causing the famine? Another reason for examining this topic is because Russia's leading historian of the famines of the early 1930s in the Soviet Union, Viktor Kondrashin, has been stressing in his recent publications that the Communist Party of Ukraine leadership, especially its first secretary or head of the Communist Party in Ukraine, Stanislav Kosior, bears a considerable degree of responsibility for the famine. I believe that this is an attempt by Kondrashin and other Russian historians close to the government to make the Kremlin leadership seem less responsible. It is an argument that undermines the view that the Holodomor was a genocide or a key component of Stalin's genocide in Ukraine. Another way to approach the question of why one should examine what was said and what occurred at, at this conference is because it was called to discuss one topic only, the state of affairs in the Ukrainian countryside. And finally, the date that the conference was held is also of some importance. The conference was held at the beginning of July, 1932, uh, during the first part of the famine and on the cusp of a new agricultural or crop year. The famine of 1932-33 in Ukraine, the Holodomor took place basically within a time span of two agricultural or crop years, the 1931-32 crop year and the 1932-33 crop year. It was a two-stage famine linked to the two crop years with the second stage being the more deadly one. The latter part of stage two of the famine and its aftermath did extend into the third crop year of 1933-34 but the extremely high mortality rate was dropping by late summer 1933. A crop year begins with the harvest. In the southern part of Ukraine, harvesting begins in July, in the northern areas a bit later. So the conference took place in the period at the end of the old crop year when sowing should have been completed and the new crop year when harvesting is about to begin. The conference was taking place during the first part of the Holodomor, which had begun in late 1931, early 32, several months after the harvesting of the 1931 crop had already commenced, but before its completion and before the state's grain collection campaign, which was tied to harvesting had been completed. Both campaigns, the harvesting and the collection campaign took place at the same time. The amount of grain or the quota that the Soviet state had established to collect or take from Ukraine was a bit more than one third of the estimated harvest from the 1931 crop. The trouble with the estimate was that it was based on an inflated or unrealistic estimate. In other words, it was a, um, um, a, um, an exaggerated estimate and it was an estimate that was made of the crop as it stood in the field or as we would say um, on the stem. A more realistic estimate would have been based on the amount of grain not in the field but actually taken to the barn for storage. That is after the grain in the field had been mown or cut, gathered, threshed and transported to storage facilities. The main reason for this comment is because losses during harvesting were very high in Ukraine. It was common to have at least 20% of the harvest lost. As background, it is useful to mention that from 1930 to the end of 1931, wholesale collectivization and dekulakization had also been carried out in the Ukrainian countryside systematically and ruthlessly 
including through the use of force by Communist Party officials. The policies were highly unpopular and met with resistance by much of the peasantry. The collectivization, decolocalization, and resistance contributed to the disorganization and chaos that were quite common on the newly organized collective farms. Collectivization and decolocalization uh, was therefore undermining the productive capacity of the countryside or the capacity of the countryside to produce a good harvest. The weather in 1931 was also not favorable to a good yield that year. In addition, losses during harvesting were extremely high in the 1931 harvest, well exceeding the usual 20%. Uh, averaging perhaps as high as 40% that year. As a result, the harvest that was actually collected and taken for storage was much lower than expected or anticipated. The grain harvest of 1930 was about 22 million tons and the authorities were estimating that the 1931 harvest would be about the same. It may have been, however, as low as 14 million tons or even less. The grain collection quota was based on the high harvest estimate of 22 million tons, and it was not lowered to reflect the actual amount harvested. To meet the demands of the central authorities to meet the quota, local officials then, oh boy, uh, local uh, uh, engaged in um, uh, various, um, uh, repressions uh, and uh, used force, uh, terror uh, in collecting the grain. They, in, they, uh, they confiscated property of those peasants that were not able to meet the plan, made arrests, prosecuted and exiled those peasants who were not able to meet the assigned quotas. They tolerated or approved of the arbitrary taking of grain by collection squads to meet the state imposed quotas. This included the taking of seed grain from both the collective farms and those individual peasant hull households that had not had yet joined or been forced to join the collective farms. So the excessive grain collections from a much smaller harvest and other collections of food in, you know, from the 1931 harvest triggered the famine in late 1931. Moreover, grain collections continued until mid-March of 1932, as Vyacheslav Molotov, the head of government of the Soviet Union and a Stalin loyalist, had been sent to Ukraine in December 1931 to pressure Ukraine's communists to continue collecting grain to meet the quota. Uh, thus, grain was being taken from Ukraine's collective farms and individual peasant house households, not only during a period when famine was occurring, but also at a time in the agricultural year when preparations and work should have been taking place for the new crop year of 1932-33. This would have included the final gathering and storing of seed needed for spring sowing, preparing for spring sowing, and the completion of spring sowing. This all has to be done before the end of June of 1932. And the collections, as I mentioned, were still taking place uh, into March of 1932. The date of the holding of the third party conference, therefore, was important because it was held at a time when collectivization was nearing completion. As reported at, at the conference itself, about 70% of Ukraine's house um, uh, uh, farm um, um, farm households had been organized into uh, collectives and about 73% of all farmland was under the jurisdiction of the newly organized collective farms. This meant that the bulk of Ukraine's agricultural out output was now coming from collective farms and not from individual farmers. The collective farms were thus the focus of attention of the authorities as they needed a good output in 1932 to fulfill the plan which was approved by central authorities on May the 6th. The plan or grain quota assigned Ukraine, however, needed formal ratification by Ukraine's Communist Party, which was to take place at this third party conference. The quota established for Ukraine from the 1932 harvest 
was lower than the 1931 quota. However, on the eve of the 1932-33 agricultural year, the Ukrainian countryside was in a much deeper crisis than in 1931. Tens of thousands had already died of hunger and millions were hungry or starving. Tens of thousands had left their villages for Russia and Belarus to barter for or buy bread where it was more plentiful and where it was less expensive. The mass exodus resulted in overcrowded railway stations filled with hungry peasants, including many starving children. Many, many young men were leaving for the cities to escape and find work. Of those who remained on the, on the farms, many were too weak to work or um, uh, they were um, unable to um, um, uh, work, work at all or didn't want to work because they weren't being uh, fed. They had nothing to eat. Um, um, more than half of all collective farmers who were supposed to be paid in kind had not been paid anything for their work in 1931. Collective farms and individual farmers were short of seed grain because most of it had been taken to fill Ukraine's grain collection quota. And as mentioned, grain collections continued due to pressure from Moscow, that is Molotov, into early 1932. Um, Alexander, could you show the first slide? Aid from central reserves was controlled by the authorities in Moscow. When it arrived, when, when it finally began to arrive in, in Ukraine in spring 1932, it was inadequate to supply the country with enough seed or food to feed the hungry. Most of the aid that was released by central authorities um, to Russian regions and to the, the republics like Ukraine were loans in seed to be repaid, to be used for sowing and not for consumption. If you look at the screen, you'll see um, that under prod suda, that would be the um, um, amount or the amount of grain that was given for food and sem suda would be the amount of um, grain that is um, meant for sowing. Russian regions as well were the first to be authorized to receive aid in early, 1930, in early February 1932. Ukraine did not receive, begin to receiving aid until uh, towards the end of March. Of the Russian regions that received aid, the Urals region received about twice as much aid as, as Ukraine did, while Western Siberia received the same amount as, as Ukraine did. But, but about twice as much as food aid. And you can see that on the, on, the, on the chart if you take a look at it. One result and symptom of the crisis in the Ukrainian countryside in 1932 was that many fields went unsown in grain that spring. Additionally, spring sowing was conducted late and done poorly. As seed was scarce, many fields were sown thinly as well, they were not being tended properly. This included fields planted in sugar beets, which needed lots of weeding. In early summer of 1932, on the eve of the harvest, it was evident that many fields were choked with weeds. All signs pointed to a low yield, worse than in previous years, as well as to great difficulties ahead and gathering the crops and preventing huge losses during harvesting. Although tractors were being provided to collective farms in 1932, horses were still widely used as draft power. Most had died or were too weak to work in 1931-32. Top communist party authorities in Moscow and in Ukraine were aware of these problems. Measures could have been taken to avoid plunging the country into a deeper crisis in 1932-33. They could have alleviated the suffering and mass deaths by reversing or revising policies in the summer of 1932, lowering drastically state grain collection quotas, slowing the pace of investments in, in, um, in um, industrialization, 
easing restrictions, allowing easier access to food, stimulating trade in grain, halting exports of food products, importing food, and launching a massive aid program to feed the hungry. This did not take place. However, Ukraine's top Communist Party and government officials did make some efforts to try to mitigate the impending disaster, including at the conference, which ultimately failed. In spring 1932, they had been sent to the countryside and had seen with their own eyes what was taking place. Next slide. Uh, here you see a, um, a photograph of Blas Chubar, who was the head of the uh, Ukrainians of the Ukrainian SSR's government at this time. And um, he, on June 10th, um, he wrote a letter to both Stalin and Molotov, less than one month before the conference. Um, and I believe that um, this, is, this was part of, or it's a possibility that this was part of a plan by the Ukrainian leadership to try to get a reduction in the grain collection plan. Um, in any case, Vlas Chubar was also a member of the Politburo of the Communist Party of Ukraine, in addition to being the head of its government. The highest body, uh, the Politburo was the highest body of the communist apparatus um, 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 in Ukraine. And another letter written on the same day, on June 10th, was by Hrhori Petrovsky. We'll come to his letter later. I want to now uh, go to the next slide. So on June 10th, Vlas Chubar wrote a very long letter with many details about what was taking place in Ukraine. And I'd like you to look at just maybe the red um, or the parts in red on the screen because he had been to uh, uh, many of the villages and districts in the Kyiv and Vinnytsia oblasts. He admitted that um, the Ukrainian authorities had uh, been thought that the countryside would be able to meet the quotas, but were mistaken. That is, um, they um, overtaxed the country and were responsible in part for the famine. The harvest was not that good and losses were very high during harvesting, mainly because collective farms were poorly organized and not well ran, run. This picture of overextension and disarray became vividly clear in the spring of 1932 when the last resources that people had was being depleted and during the spring sowing period. So what was taking place was famine was striking at a time when Farmers needed to be out in the fields working. And of course, this made it uh, even more difficult for uh, farmers to um, 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 complete their work that spring. And what he tells Stalin is that um, a great number of districts in Ukraine, a minimum of 100, um, had been struck by famine. And that famine had occurred as early as December of 1931. And that uh, people were dying in the tens and hundreds in every village that he had visited. Um, he informed Stalin about all of the violence and um, excessive um, force used by collection brigades um, about um, the fact that uh, people were running out of food, there was no feed for animals, um, massive deaths occurring in some villages in the right bank. Um, the number of horses that were lost uh, were um, up to 80%. Many men had left the village and um, he kept um, informing Stalin about the other problems in the countryside and uh, what needed to be done to, um, uh, in his view, to uh, improve the situation. 
Um, he also noted that resistance or opposition sentiments were growing and among these sentiments, uh, nationalist or Petlerite sentiments were also growing. Um, and this was in part due to the uh, terrible conditions and the uh, uh, horrors that people had been um, uh, experiencing. So um, he does ask Stalin to um, send more aid that would encourage people to work. And uh, he gives a particular sum of uh, how much food was needed as a minimum. And the last point is very important. The agricultural economy had been undermined to such a degree that the grain and meat collections and other tasks that were being set for 1932-33 needed to be corrected. Next slide. The next letter, also written on June 10th, was by Rehori Petrovsky. And he was the head of the Ukraine state, or sort of the president of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Uh, he was also a member of the Politburo. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Petrovsky visited um, left bank Ukraine, the Poltava region. Again, he admitted, as did Shubar, that the Ukrainian leadership should not have accepted the heavy plan that was uh, imposed on them. Uh, and, but having, having, having accepted the plan, they realized that it would be difficult and that, as he put it, cups would be broken. But what he saw in the village, villages convinced him that they had really overdid it. Um, the language that he uses is kind of um, interesting. But he does state that a number of, uh, directly that a number of villages that he visited were, were gripped in famine and that he was severely criticized at, the, at, these, um, at these meetings that he held with villagers. And he writes to Stalin that uh, he was told by peasants, why did the authorities create an artificial famine? We had a crop. Why was the seed material taken? Why do Ukrainians have to travel to non-grain producing regions to buy grain? He was unable, he writes, to uh, respond to these cries for help. And one of the reasons is because uh, the Ukrainian authorities did not control the supplies of grain. They were almost utterly dependent on central authorities. And he goes on to list other sorts of um, problems and uh, things that he saw. And what Petrovsky asks Stalin is for food aid of at least uh, 32.8 thousand tons or an additional 24 or as a minimum 24.6 thousand tons. And he writes again, similarly to um, uh, Chubar, that the excessive grain collections had undermined the countryside. He also um, writes that resistance was rising and opposition was rising because of the famine and anti-collective farm sentiment was also rising and that there were occurrences of peasants who were farmers who were leaving the collective farms. Interestingly, he writes that up to two thirds of the men in the villages have left in search of bread. Petrovsky writes in his letter, this was an elementary exodus to Belarus, to North Caucasus and to central and to Northwest Russia. He gives a, um, an example of where they went to near the train hub or train station Dno, close to Pskov, that's in Northwestern Russia, not a grain producing region. One could buy bread for a price of 30 to 40 rubles per pood. 
that's about 16.38 kilograms. While in Ukraine, it's sold for about 100 to 140. Ukraine is a grain producing region and the prices you see are quite a bit higher. So this gives you an idea of what the Kremlin's policy, how the Kremlin's policies had distorted the market. He ended the letter by once again asking for aid and buckwheat for sowing material. And the reason he asked for buckwheat is because buckwheat is a crop, is a grain that can, um, uh, doesn't need as much time to ripen as wheat or rye does. <coughs> Excuse me. Joseph Stalin received these letters, but as far as we know, he never replied. He did, however, write, and this also tells you something about relations between the center and, the, and his uh, subordinates. He did, however, write on June 15th to his protege and trusted Lieutenant Lazar Kaganovich. In his letter, Stalin deemed the letters by Petrovsky and Shubar unacceptable. He expressed dissatisfaction over the management of affairs in Ukraine and suggested its, its, its leadership needed to be changed. Next slide, please. In a July 2 letter that Stalin sent to Lazar Kaganovich and Vyacheslav Molotov, um, and you see on the slide the pictures of the two, and Molotov was at this time the head of the Soviet government, and Lazar Kaganovich, uh, who was born in Ukraine, was um, a high-ranking member of the uh, Soviet uh, Communist Party's apparatus and a member of the Politburo and a close ally of Stalin. Stalin instructed them in his July 2 letter that they must attend the third all-Ukrainian conference of the Communist Party of Ukraine. Apparently concerned that Ukraine's grain quota and the Kremlin's agricultural policies could be questioned and challenged at the conference. He charged the two to secure a genuine Bolshevik outcome at the conference. That is secure an outcome that he wanted. Before the Ukrainian meeting on the 28th and the 29th of June, Kremlin leaders convened a conference in Moscow to review the grain collection plan with sub-center leaders from all of the regions and republics of the Soviet Union. Kaganovich wrote to Stalin immediately after that conference that resistance to accepting the plan was notable from the Ukrainians who had to be pressured exceedingly hard and admonished to better control the lower level party officials in the Ukrainian party. In Ukraine, Officials began to document or were documenting the seriousness of the situation. Next slide, please. Just prior to the convening of the Ukrainian conference, they had prepared a list of districts that were suffering from famine. These documents were published in a book co-edited by Yuri Shapoval and Valery Vasilyev, Commander of Holodu, in 2002. And uh, there you can see the um, list of the districts that uh, were compiled by Ukrainian authorities and uh, just on the eve of the conference. Next slide, please. The third all Ukrainian conference of the Communist Party of Ukraine well, held July 6 to 9 was attended by 252 delegates in addition to the two Kremlin emissaries, Molotov and Kaganovich, and leading figures of the Communist Party of Ukraine, 158 district level party secretaries responsible for local collections were also present. Stanislav Kosior, and here you see a photo of him and a short biography, the first secretary or leader of Ukraine's branch of the Communist Party delivered the keynote address which was then discussed by other speakers. In this presentation, I'll be focusing on his speech and briefly on some of the other major and mid-level party officials in Ukraine and not speeches by lower level officials. 
One can read about some of these speeches in an article uh, published by um, Yuri Shapoval in, in his co-edited book. And if someone wants to ask questions about them, I'll be glad to answer them after the lecture. Kosior in his speech, next slide please, stressed the overall importance and even determining role of Ukraine in the Soviet Union's agricultural economy. Reaching the five-year plan's goals for industrialization, the building of new factories, most of which were in Russia, depended to a large degree on how well Ukraine's agricultural economy functioned, how much grain and other products could be used to export, to earn hard currency, to import machinery and know-how from the West, and how much of this food could be sent to the cities and new, and new industrial areas to feed the workers. Kosior stressed in his speech, however, that spring sowing that year had been very unsatisfactory, worse than in all previous several years. Sowing was conducted late, and most importantly, 2.2 million hectares was not sown at all. And when you think about this figure, um, it, it was about 11% of all of the territory that was designated to be sown in grain that year. Kosior explained in part that the problems in, in the springtime were due in part to a massive death of horses. He, uh, and I spoke about that. There just was no, 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 no fodder to feed them and they were not cared for well. So they began dying off and people were eating food that was meant for fodder. So there was nothing available for the horses. Kosior also in a speech made direct references to famine. This year, there was a very difficult food situation. And this is a uh, euphemism for famine, but anyway, he continues in a number of districts, even more in a number of districts, one must say this directly, that people were starving and the lack of bread led to the collapse of some of the collective farms. Another factor that was um, unfavorable for the spring sowing season was the weather. <clears throat> Commenting on the convictions and beliefs commonly held among party members, Kosior commented that many believed that Ukraine found itself in difficult straits because of the large difficult grain procurement plans or quotas or the unreasonable or the unrealizable quotas assigned Ukraine. In the crop year just completed, there had been many excesses and outrages committed against peasants and collective farms. farmers, he um, uh, said, and unauthorized arbitrary searches. Kosior said that these actions undermined the authority of the party and were counter-revolutionary. Well, this is an excuse because obviously um, there was pressure on these local officials to collect as much grain as possible. Local officials, Kosior uh, continued, claimed that excesses occurred because of the size of the plan, that the, the local officials were committed in trying to meet the quota, which created the difficulties and the famine. Kosior rejected these arguments, claiming that there were always those in the party such as the right-wing opportunists who had argued that the plans were too difficult and party members who claimed that, quote, we are robbing Ukraine for Moscow's benefit. They were articulating, he said, Kulak theories, Petnerite, that is nationalist theories. And that these, these views, he continued, had been circulating earlier or they were present earlier, they were there, but now, that is in the immediate period leading up to this conference, they were becoming more openly and loudly stated. Elaborating further on the reasons for the crisis, Kosior said that the party had not been paying enough attention to and had lost, lost touch with what was taking place in the countryside. There were two other reasons for the difficulties. Huge losses had occurred during harvesting. 30 to 40%, sometimes up to 50%, and even more of the grain had been left in the fields, especially in the southern regions, he reported. The huge losses were the cause of the food shortages. Let me explain. 
if 40% of the potential harvest was lost, that meant that only 20% or 27% of the potential harvest remained for the producers because the party uh, collectors were taking the rest of it. So the amount of grain left over after the grain collections were taking place was uh, very small. Another reason for the problems in the countryside or the crisis was the dismanagement and or disorganization of the collective farms, which he blamed on Kulak activities. <coughs> Kosior singled out among all of the districts, the Umain district as one of the most troublesome. It was full of Kulaks, thieves, and Petyarites where the party apparatus had been compromised the most and where the greatest abuses had taken place. Interestingly, Kosior in a letter to Stalin earlier that year had mentioned that there was an, a nationalist led uprising in Umain district in early 1932. So Kosior blamed lower level officials for the crisis in the countryside, charged that the lower level party members did not examine critically their own work but complained that the Republic's leaders had foisted unreasonable plans on them. He rejected the notion that lower level officials engaged in all sorts of abuses against collective farmers because of the size of the plan. Instead, what he claimed is lower level officials had to recognize their mistakes and correct them. And this is a uh, typical um, um, tactic of party leaders is to blame the lower level officials for their problems or for what they had themselves uh, had been partly responsible for creating. In his speech, Kosior defended the quota assigned for Ukraine in 1932. In summarizing the difficulties ahead in fulfilling that plan or that quota, Kosior mentioned again the 2.2 million hectare um, spring shortfall. He also pointed to losses during harvesting the 1931 crop, which were higher than the previous year. He concluded that despite the shortfall in spring sowing, the main determinant in fulfilling the plan was to minimize losses when harvesting the 1932 crop that year. That is, he suggested that the situation could be saved if only the party were able to um, minimize harvest losses. And this way the plan could be met and uh, people would have enough food to eat. Uh, this was an illusion and I'll uh, get to that a little bit later on. Uh, other speakers, and I want you to go to the next slide. Okay, I got it. There it is. Yes. Okay. I want to go to some of the next uh, speak speeches that were given at the conference. And um, they also spoke at length about losses during harvesting, mismanagement by local officials, poor work, the weaknesses of the newly established collective farms. And for this presentation, I want to draw your attention to what Nikola Skripnik, uh, many of you are probably familiar with him because he was a leading figure in the Ukrainian Communist Party and head of the so-called National Communists who committed suicide in 1933. Uh, in his speech, he also mentioned the famine and losses during harvesting. Next slide, please. What did Skripnik say in his speech? We had a shameful failure in the spring. We uh, didn't know how bad the food situation was, but we have to say straightforwardly now that the situation is very difficult. We had failures in the food situation and a whole series of collective farms and villages in a whole row of districts. He had visited the Moldovia area, uh, which was under Ukraine's jurisdiction at that time. And he asked the question, what is the reason for our current failures, our current situation? 
And this is what the peasants told him. Here is what he was told. I was in a district in Moldavia. And I was told that the reason is that everything was swept away from us with a broom. They clamped down and crushed us. In other words, Skripnik went, went on, the communists were at fault for the non-fulfillment of the grain procurement plan. For the poor food situation, the communists took the grain and that is why there is no grain to live on. That is why there is a difficult food situation. That is why there is famine in some localities. But Skripnik continues further. I saw the fields of that village. And when I came and I heard that supposedly the communists were responsible for a difficult situation, I said, this is not true. This is a lie, a kulak lie, because I saw the fields. I saw the fallen grain growing there. There were certainly more than six to, to eight poods sown there. Grain was harvested poorly. And that spoke for the cause of the present state of affairs. If the whole harvest had been properly gathered in this village, there would have been enough for the complete fulfillment of the grain plan. There would have been enough for food for the next harvest. And there would have even been a surplus for sale. Skripnik's assessment echoed that of his leader, Kosior, which had been promoted by central authorities that all efforts had to be focused on preventing losses during harvesting. And I'll comment on this later in my uh, presentation. I now want to point to other speakers besides Kosior, who spoke about the rise of nationalism in the Ukrainian countryside and in the country at whole. Next slide, please. Uh, and among the speakers who spoke at the conference was Roman Terekhov, leader of Kharkiv Oblast's party um, organization, who said in a speech that nationalists had been complaining that Ukraine's grain quota was unrealistic and was overtaxing or was um, 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 exploitative. It was common, he claimed, to hear conversations in Ukraine's government establishments, and you have to remember here that Kharkiv was the head of government at this time, and including in institutions of higher learning and among workers at enterprises that, quote, Moscow had taken the grain and the Kremlin leadership was responsible for the crisis. Volodymyr Chernyavsky, first secretary of Vinnytsia Oblast, stated that the national and social questions in the Ukrainian village were intertwined in his, in his speech. Rhodi Petrovsky in his speech commented that the situation in the Ukrainian countryside was complicated because of the existence of, um, because the Kulak, Ukrainian Kulak was very, very strong or was um, very powerful. Um, <clears throat> A similar national interpretation was given to the Kremlin's policies in a statement by Communist Party member Poltavitz at a June 11 session of the city Poltava's party commission. So socialism had been built in Russia, but in Ukraine, there is famine. In Molotov's speech himself, he criticized the management of agricultural affairs in Ukraine, stating that officials were evading responsibility by pointing to the size of the grain quotas and external factors. I take this as probably a reference to the Kremlin leadership and their policies. Molotov called such arguments anti-Bolshevik. He made absolutely clear the hardline position of the central authorities in the following statement. There will be no concessions or vacillations in the problem of fulfilling the tasks set by the party and the Soviet government. A central task that Molotov and Kaganovich had set out to do in attending the conference was to get Ukraine's officials to accept the grain collection quota and to mobilize party cadres to fulfill that task. Next slide. At, at the end of the first day of the conference, Molotov and Kaganovich wrote to Stalin that they had attended a meeting of Ukraine's Politburo, where all of its members, every single one of them, had spoken in favor of reducing the Republic's grain collection target. 
the Ukrainian Politburo members argued that this should be done because 2.2 million hectares in spring grain had not been sown. And in addition, 0.8 million hectares of fall sown grain had been lost due to bad weather. That is about almost somewhere between 14 and 15% of all of the land that had been set aside to be sown in grain. It's quite a bit of, um, it's quite a bit of, um, of uh, land that would not be yielding any, any crop at all. Stalin's closest collaborators, however, reported that they categorically refused to reconsider the plan and successfully pressured Ukraine's Politburo at that meeting to pass, in their presence, a resolution affirming as correct the grain collection quota for unconditional fulfillment. So, as you see, the last stand of the Ukrainian communists ended there. Ukraine's, Ukraine's grain collection quota for the peasant sector was confirmed by conference delegates on 9th of July and was made part of the conference's resol resolution, which set policy and guidelines for party members. While acknowledging difficulties, the published resolution stressed that Ukraine had every opportunity to fulfill the grain procurement plan, which was considerably lower than the previous year. In their 6th July letter to Stalin, Kaganovich and Maltov also noted that the draft, the unacceptability of the draft revolution prepared for ratification at the conference. For because of its weak criticism of, of Ukraine's leadership, insufficient support for the grain collection quota, and the failure to counteract demobilizing attitudes among Ukraine's of, of party officials. They informed Stalin that changes were to be made to the resolution and that Kosior was delegated to make them following an exchange of views. An important change made to the draft was the deletion of the uh, reference to the 2.2 million hectare spring shortfall in grain, which was mentioned by Stalin and Kaganovich in their 6th July letter to Stalin and also in the speeches um, made at the conference. The resolution contained in the published stenographic report instead that 4.5% less acreage was sown in 1932 than in 1931. This presumably was a reference to shortfall for all crops and not just grain. And it appears that the substitution of the percentage figure and a revision of the text was done to not draw attention to the large amount of unsown acreage in grain and to hide its effect on grain output. If one counts, okay, uh, the Kremlin authorities were trying therefore to hide the seriousness of the shortfall. And this can be seen also from the fact that although Molotov in his speech mentioned the 2.2 million hectare shortfall. In the published version in a newspaper Pravda, this passage was missing. Last slide, please. Conclusions. The leadership of the Communist Party of Ukraine did try to convince USSR leaders to soften or revise collection targets and policies and take steps to dampen the famine, but failed. The leadership of the party, when pressured by central authorities, fell into line. This was in keeping with party policies and traditions requiring obedience and the carrying out of orders and policies without question, once decisions were made by the top leadership. The leaders of Ukraine's Communist Party, therefore, were guilty of carrying out orders leading to and causing the Holodomor, but were not themselves involved in establishing the major policies causing famine. The carrying out of grain collections in Ukraine in conjunction with and following collectivization provoked resistance, both social and national in form and content. The rise of a national reaction or nationalism to the Kremlin's policies was widespread enough to be acknowledged by top party officials in Ukraine at the third party conference, including its leader, Stanislav Kosior. 
The reluctance of Ukraine's communist leaders to carry out without question the Kremlin's policies and the rise in nationalism in Ukraine was noted by Stalin. He revealed his thoughts on how to respond in correspondence with Lazar Kaganovich most fully in his August 11th letter. In that letter, Stalin concluded that because of the rise in nationalism, Ukraine could be lost and sketched out a plan to take Ukraine more firmly under the Kremlin's direct control. Stalin's letter of August 11 then was probably at least motivated by what was said at the third party conference and reflects his understanding of the growing potential of separatism in Ukraine. The decision to focus on cutting losses during harvesting to meet the grain collection quota and gather enough grain to prevent famine was doomed to failure as the countryside's productive capacities was too seriously undermined in 1932. The repressive and predatory policies of the Soviet state in the Ukrainian countryside increased resistance to and distrust of the regime among the collective farm workers and individual farmers. Many were also too weak to work or to work well, or they did not want to work hard because they had little, little or no incentive to do so. The authorities authorized doctoring and deleting parts of the stenographic report where the rise in nationalism was discussed and covering up information on the seriousness of the crisis in the countryside, specifically deleting this uh, shortfall of 2.2 million hectares. Within a month following the conference, on August 7th, 1932, the draconian law authorizing capital punishment and a minimum 10 year sentence for taking even a small amount of grain from collective farm fields was passed. The infamous five years of, five years of corn law, Zakon Propiat Koloskiu. It was absolutely clear now what the Soviet regime's leadership intended. And I end my, my lecture, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I remind everyone that you may ask questions by uh, doing it on the Q&A window below. Uh, I realize it may take some time to put on questions, but uh, perhaps to start. Uh, Frank, I we, we do yeah. have a question. Frank? Yeah, I see. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Do you want to start? We do have yeah. questions. Yeah, okay. We do have questions. Okay. You go uh, ahead. You okay. Start but, first? Yeah, yeah. If I may uh, start and then, then, then we'll turn on to questions. If you could outline a little bit more, you at the beginning of your talk mentioned that Kondrashin uh, is trying to divert in his writings uh, uh, guilt from the Kremlin and put it upon the Ukrainian uh, leadership. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about what, in what writings, how does he do it, and what are his sources? And then I'll turn it over to uh, Marta Bazyuk to for further questions. Well, Kondrashin uh, basically blames most of the um, uh, most of the um, I guess uh, or bases most of his arguments on um, Kosior not um, um, asking uh, for for uh, relief. And for Kosior um, trying to uh, handle things on his own without informing Kremlin authorities what was going on. And I would say that would be his main argument. And um, he writes about this in um, an essay that he published, which is available online. And as well, uh, more fully in a book he published in 2018. I don't recall the title of it right now, but it's um, it's a um, um, revised version of his 2008 book. And um, I think he has, um, I, I think there is some merit to his argument, but again, um, I think you have to look at Kosior's position, first of all. He was a Kremlin appointee so he was not someone that the Ukrainian party had chosen to be leader of Ukraine's party. And he was also, in addition to being a leader of Ukraine's party, he was a member of the Kremlin's Politburo. So he was 
aware of what was going on in the Kremlin and the Kremlin authorities had access to him and communicated with him. So um, that's, one, that's one point. And the other point is that um, there was a lot of pressure put on Ukraine uh, to um, carry the load uh, for uh, producing um, agricultural goods to support the industrialization effort. And I think the Ukrainian party members uh, being good communists were uh, in favor of industrialization. Um, so they uh, reluctantly went along with this. Um, however, in, at the end of 1931, uh, it was becoming evident that um, as, Kos as uh, Petrovsky and as Chuba wrote, is that they overextended uh, things. Um, um, the situation was becoming um, uncontrollable. Um, the collective farm system was breaking apart. Uh, people were starting to die, starve and die. And um, at this point, uh, <clears throat> Molotov was sent to Ukraine to um, get the Ukrainian party to um, increase grain collections. And Molotov was told at the meeting that um, there are problems in the countryside and uh, he ignored those problems and he ignored these pleas. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, if you look at when aid was given to the um, various Russian regions and to Ukraine itself, uh, you can see that there's um, a, um, a one and a half to two month um, gap. The Russian regions were given assistance first, and they were given quite a lot of assistance compared to Ukraine. Ukraine was producing about uh, a third of the um, grain uh, for the entire Soviet Union, uh, yet um, it was, uh, it, was, it was not given all that much assistance in 1932. And part of the reason is because the Kremlin was forcing these collections to continue into March of 1932. So that's another argument I would made. And the third argument I would make is that the Ukrainian authorities did um, implore Stalin. They did um, write to him they did uh, argue before Molotov and Kaganovich that the 1932 plan should be um, uh, reduced. And they were told, uh, yet. Yeah. Bogdan, we have a number of questions. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. OK, from Karolina Kuzura. She thanks you for an interesting lecture and asks, could you say a little bit more about how the lower level officials discuss the situation in the countryside at the conference? OK. Um, a number of lower officials uh, spoke, and this was recorded in the stenographic report. I have not read the entire uh, report yet. I've read parts of it. What I've seen is that some of the officials were um, basically agreeing with the republic level leaders. That is saying that, yes, the farms are you know, not organized well, um, we need to take matters under control. The kulaks are very active, we need to clamp down on them. But there were, there were those who said that um, um, famine had occurred in the districts, that uh, officials were um, uh, abusive towards the peasants, officials were um, employing um, methods which were um, violent, which, um, you know, they, they were taking all, all of the food, all of the grain, um, and that, um, the, you know, some of these officials were sent by um, uh, central authorities into the countryside, because we know that central authorities were sending uh, officials from the cities um, in Ukraine, but also from, from outside of Ukraine into the Ukrainian countryside to aid in the collection of grain. So um, 
there was that um, at the uh, that was mentioned at the conference. One Could I just uh, tag on to Carolina Kuzura's question? Uh, the lower level officials, are there perhaps a, a dozen who spoke or, or, de, or, or tens? Give us a sense of you know, how, how, how many opinions would likely be, would show up in a transcript of a conference like this. Oh, I wish I had the table of contents with me. Um, but but um, I mean, we don't know whether it's five or 50. It, 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 it would be more than 10. Okay. Okay. You ready for the next question, Bogdan? Yeah. Okay. Harry Evashchuk asks you, for, he thanks you for your informative lecture and asks, how prevalent was the practice of preventing villagers from leaving their area and who would have carried this out? Right. Um, in 1932, uh, restrictions were not as severe as in 1933. The um, blockading of Ukraine uh, took place in January of 1933. And um, the passport system was enacted in late 1932 in December. So in the spring and summer of 1932, peasants could still uh, go, to a go to a railway station and buy tickets. However, there were restrictions in place. Um, they were not um, encouraged to do so. They were told to go home. Um, they, were, they, were, um, ref they were refused. Um, if you read the... Um, documents in the collection Foreign Office and the Famine and the description by Andrew Cairns. Um, the trains that were leaving the cities of Ukraine for the north were so overcrowded um, that peasants were hanging on to the sides of the train. There were some on top of the train. Um, they were just so um, uh, desperate to get away and to, and to get grain. And one can make maybe some analogy to the depression area, era in the United States because lots of people were hitchhiking on trains or catching rides on trains at the time. But what Cairns describes is simply, um, you know, um, fit for a movie. It's, it's just um, unbelievably uh, striking um, how uh, crowded these and how crowded and filthy these trains and these stations were. Okay, the next question from Nina Sakun. Did the peasants distinguish between Russian central authority communists and local communist leaders? I assume this qu question is in terms of blame. Uh, I guess it depends who was asked. Uh, I would think that, um, you know, um, there would be some, yes, there, there would be some um, um, idea among the peasants that, you know, our grain is being taken by Moscow or, you know, um, these are um, people being sent from Russia because they spoke Russian. Uh, they could have been officials from Ukraine who were Russian speaking, uh, but because they spoke Russian, they were uh, you know, seen to be Russians and foreigners. Um, so local officials who the peasants knew, obviously uh, they would be um, um, familiar with and know whether they were approachable or they were not approachable, whether, whether they could be frank and open with them or whether they would have to hide uh, what they uh, really had on their minds. So um, it depends on the situation and on the, and on the particular peasant. And some, were, some, some peasants were more aware of what was going on and others were, um, I think, less aware. So, but, but, but certainly there was this awareness of us and them and uh, Russians or, you know, and us, 
Russians and Ukrainians. Okay, I'll, I'll move to the next question from Albert Rosenblatt. Uh, he writes, your lecture seems to imply that the Soviet central government wanted the wheat production without any concern for the welfare of the peasants. And they were also afraid, afraid of losing Ukraine to Poland. Was genocide a goal of the Kremlin or was it an effect of their policies? Well, I think there's a difference between Kremlin policies in up to the summer of 1932 and Kremlin policies uh, from the summer of 1932 and into 1933. And um, so up until the summer of 1932, I would say it's not clear that genocide was um, intended or it's not clear that genocide would be an outcome. Um, and this is what I think I try to imply in my lecture. And uh, this, this, this conference takes place during a pivotal point. Um, so the Kremlin, yes, the Kremlin wanted to take as much grain, as much food as possible. This was their primary concern. Ukraine was a milking cow and uh, they, were not they were not that concerned that the cow was um, weak, that the cow was thin, that the cow uh, was not able to produce uh, as much milk as it produced earlier. Uh, they were focused on getting as much production out of Ukraine as possible. Um, we tend to look at the, the um, um, establishment of the collective farms as a communist experiment. It was, but the, um, but the uh, establishment of the collective farms was also a way of establishing commercial agriculture in the Soviet Union. And the communist authorities, although they were not capitalists, uh, they were interested in getting as much output out of these collective farms as possible. And because they had, uh, they were so focused on their plans, they were so focused on uh, building this um, um, industrial giant that uh, they were willing to um, sacrifice the peasants. Um, and as for genocide, the question becomes, I think, a bit clearer and the charge that one could make becomes a bit firmer. The more one reads the documents um, extending from the summer of 1932 and more particularly um, in 1933 and what the Kremlin does um, and the focus on the national side of repressions becomes clearer in late 1932, early 1933 and it becomes widespread in the middle of 19, by the middle of 1933. So um, uh, we see a progression towards a, um, a national sort of reckoning um, with Ukraine. And um, I don't think Stalin in particular was, um, um, thought that Ukraine would go to Poland or become a part of Poland, but that Ukraine could become a Polish, perhaps a Polish satellite. He was worried about Ukraine becoming an, in, an independent country. Okay, I have a question from Olga Andrievsky. Uh, she writes, Fedir Pehido, Pahido, in his testimony to the Kerstin Committee after the war, discusses the party conference and also mentions that Ukrainian authorities had initiated the Darban case, which demonstrated prior to the beginning of the conference the existence of a great criminal conspiracy for the plundering of peasants under the guise of enforcing delivery of grain quotas. Have you run across this in your research? Can you talk about this criminal case and what happened to it? Right, uh, the Drabyev case is discussed um, actually at the conference by uh, one of the uh, secretaries. Um, and uh, there are um, uh, many articles published in the Ukrainian newspapers of the time 
about the Drabi of case. I am not familiar with the details, but certainly we know that um, uh, it was um, one of the districts in which um, um, famine occurred, one of the dis districts in which um, officials, local officials were, were tried for their abuses. And it's unclear to me whether this was part of a are an attempt at a change in policy um, uh, initiated by the Republic leaders uh, to try to um, walk back a little bit these uh, repressive and uh, violent policies or whether um, this was maybe not that and just a, um, just a show trial of some sort. But um, this topic remains to be, um, I think, studied in detail and written about. I don't know if you want to comment. Olga Bertelson comments that peasants could not travel without written permission from the village council and that they did not have passports. Well, there was no passport. Uh, they did not have passports in, in early 1932. But um, maybe we're talking about what then happened in 33. In 33, definitely, yeah. In 1933, uh, the restrictions were tightened. In 1932, the peasants were able to travel. Whether they did it by hook or by crook, um, they, were, they were able to get away en masse. And this is noted by, um, it's, it's, it's noted by Stalin. He said, um, you know, what are all these whiners from Ukraine doing, um, you know, uh, coming to Russia and wrecking our uh, collective farms. He writes this in a letter to, to, uh, to uh, Kaganovich. So well, he fact, even says about uh, destroying morale. Yeah, so yeah. the fact that there were you know, tens of thousands of Ukrainian peasants um, you know, um, in Russian cities and in, and in, in, in Belarus, trying to buy grain was very widely known and, and widely reported on. So they were able to get away. And then, and and then, this, and then this changes. And this changes in late 1932 and especially uh, you know, by, by early 1933. Uh, but it, uh, the, the restrictions uh, become um, greater as we progress in time from the summer of 1932 into 1933. Okay, and then um, someone named Ihor asks, is there any research that follows the collected grain? In other words, are there statistics that show how much grain was exported, which countries purchased grain, <laughs> what prices they were getting, etc.? What do we know about what happened to the grain? Well, what I know is that there are statistics available. Now, whether they are um, available to the degree or to, you know, in, in detail as far as prices are concerned, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there are, um, you know, some um, statistics that are available. I don't know of them, so I can't answer that question. But there are statistics that um, are readily available in books that were published in the 1930s in the Soviet Union. There's a uh, one book in particular that I looked at. Um, it concerns um, exports and gives statistics on what was exported uh, from the, the Soviet book, Union. Booked on this question assumes that all of the grain that was taken was sent for export when in no, fact- No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah. Part of the grain was exported and part of it was sent. Part of it remained in Ukraine and went to feed workers and uh, city dwellers um, um, in Ukraine itself. Uh, see, in 1928, a rationing system was um, put into place in the Soviet Union or began to be put into place. And by, 19, by the early 1930s, um, if you held a job in a city, um, if you worked in a factory, if you were an official, um, if you held a government job, 
uh, you were entitled to a certain ration. And so the grain that was collected, part of it went to feed people in all of the cities of the Soviet Union, including Ukraine. And part of it went for export. And then the grain that was left over um, was, remained with the peasants. So in effect, what took place was that the peasants and the collective farmers were left with the residuals of what remained after the collections took place. And these residuals had to be used for their seeds for the next year, as well as to feed the farmers and their families. Um, in a situation where you had these tremendous losses, of course, uh, these residuals were dwindling and in some cases uh, the farmers had nothing at all. Okay, um, Yoris Balan asks, in denials of the deliberate nature of the famine, poor weather and kulak sabotage are often blamed for it. Could you elaborate on the poor weather conditions you mentioned in the spring of 32? Was it drought, excessive rain, severe frost, or, and was it generalized throughout the agricultural regions of Ukraine or localized? What do we know? Uh, Kosyorna's speech mentions rains in the spring. Um, and uh, we know that some of the fall sown grain, in fact, quite a lot of it uh, perished, 0.8 uh, million hectares. Um, and that was due to, um, I think, uh, fall sown grain uh, is susceptible to um, uh, frosts at a, a particular times of the year. So um, if the frosts come at the wrong time, the fall sown grain can be lost. But, what, but the fall sown grain is also the first to germinate. So the first grain to be harvested is the fall sown grain. But in 1932, um, you had a situation where there was uh, more rain than usual in springtime. And I would assume that there were late frosts that um, killed the spring uh, or the fall sown grain. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, why were Molotov and Kaganovich not brought on charges? They both lived into their 90s. And I'll combine it with one other uh, question about perpetrators. Were there many murders of communists carrying out the grain collection by village resistance leaders? Uh, were higher ups ever targeted? So were there murders of communists who carried out grain requisitions and also was there ever any serious thought of bringing Molotov or Kaganovich up on charges? Yes, uh, Molotov and Kaganovich never were charged. Uh, they lived into their uh, ripe old age. Uh, in fact, Kaganovich lived to the, uh, uh, almost lived long enough to see the downfall of the Soviet Union. Um, too bad he didn't live to see it. Uh, but, um, um, they died during the Soviet period. None of the uh, people who were um, involved in uh, any of the crimes of the Stalin period or any of the subsequent crimes that took place were ever tried. So um, they just weren't able to be charged at that time because the Soviet system was still in place. And even had Kaganovich lived longer into the post-Soviet period, I doubt that he would have been ever charged because he was living in Russia. Uh, perhaps, but that's speculative. And were people who were collecting grain in the villages, were they targeted and were they killed? The answer is some of them, yes. So there were reprisals and some of these collectors were in fact um, beaten up or killed um, because of what they were doing. And uh, there, was, uh, there was resistance among, among um, 
uh, farmers um, and peasants, and some of it was uh, violent. Okay. Uh, Frank Sisson, do we have a few more minutes? We have a few more questions. Sure. Okay. I assume so, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Someone asks, um, Bogdan, do we know when did the travel ban end? I assume this is about uh, the uh, that peasants could not leave their villages. Uh, peasants did not have passports. And once the passport system came into place, um, it was uh, more difficult for them to uh, get um, a ticket to go somewhere because they needed permission to go. So, so Bukhtan, well, could you just clarify, there was a passport system that, that existed and in that system, peasants could not have passports. That's correct. Peasants could not have passports and uh, they could travel, but they had to get permission for travel. And in 1933, there was a travel ban um, initiated in January that prevented peasants from leaving the uh, borders of Ukraine. So, um, and then there were also um, uh, um, orders that peasants found in the cities were just to be sent back home. So there were um, restrictions on various levels the restrictions begin to be eased in May of 1933. And there is a directive that goes out. And I don't um, recall the details, but uh, it starts with uh, the collective farm system has now been secured. And we do not now have to continue the repressive policies that were in place in the countryside. And from this day forward, blah, blah, blah. But I don't recall the details, so I don't know what sort of restrictions were lifted at that time. <clears throat> but I would, uh, but I would suggest that May 1933 is the beginning. Okay. And Valentina Kurilu asks about the use of the word peasant being used to depict farmers and villagers in Ukraine in the 30s, when in English it is used as a der derogatory term in the 20th century. Well. Uh, we have to use some, we have to use some term um, and farmer, there are collective farmers and there are farmers, individual farmers. So maybe um, to be, um, to, to avoid using the term peasant, we could do that. However, peasant is a term that is used widely in scholarship and um, um, I don't know if it um, is, um, you know, what, whether one should be politically correct enough to sort of um, um, not use that term whatsoever. And I think in the case of, um, of uh, what is taking place in the countryside um, in Ukraine is you could use a term like peasant hyphen collective farmer. Um, and I would use that term because um, uh, these were, this was a, a time of transition. And um, so the um, individual farmer had not still been, um, had not become a collective farmer yet. I think the mentality of the two are different and that um, a collective farmer um, learns how to do things differently an individual farmer uh, thinks and does things differently. Uh, so um, in this particular period, we have kind of a, a transition period. And um, I don't know if individual farmer hyphen collective farmer uh, would um, um, make that um, known well. But maybe the question is how is a peasant not a farmer? Well, the peasant is a farmer. The peasant means small farmer, right? This is this is this is what um, um, the Italian term I think is paisan, right? Uh, so um, it's a term that's widely used in Europe, and um, we're and what this term means is basically a um, subsistence or um, um, small scale farming. So a peasant farmer could also be 
a commercial farmer, but on a very small scale. And maybe I can add to that. Uh, one of the issues would be that in, at least in Imperial Russia, the peasantry was, or Christianstva was a social stratum. Right. And you needn't be a farmer if you, you could be, you remained a peasant even if you were working in a factory or doing other things because it was a social stratum like noble or a number of others that you belong to. And that tradition from the 19th century carries into the 20th. I think we, oh, we are, yeah. Oh, we have one last question. And this is from Marta de Choc. One second, it came in through chat and not through. Okay, uh, Bogdan, would you characterize? I, I, I guess this is discussion in the. It said, "Is this the first evidence of the Communist Party acknowledging national sentiment in Ukraine?" I guess at the at the conference. Uh, well. Um... I'm not the first person to write about this. Um, there, David Marples actually wrote an article where he mentioned, uh, or he, he wrote about Tarakhov's speech. Um, I don't think that he wrote about uh, Kosior. I don't recall that, or the others that I mentioned. And I don't think that Marples uh, linked it to the, um, um, the 11th of August letter, which I am linking it to, um, because I think that um, there is um, some um, uh, merit to that argument. Um, I don't think that um, Marples or anybody else has also looked at the Molotov um, uh, remark the same way that I have, or at least stressed it like I have. Um, now, there have been others in historiography that have written about the third party conference. Shapoval has, uh, Rehori Kostyuk has, and also um, Sevolod Holubnechi. And one of the reasons why I took to this topic was because of what uh, Holubnechi and what um, Kostyuk wrote. And they realized that um, um, they didn't write about uh, nationalism per se, but they wrote that this conference was important because uh, this showed that the Ukrainian authorities were not, you know, um, were not going down with, without some kind of a fight. So this is what I got from reading their accounts. And then when you read the stenographic report from the archival copy, that's where you can get the uh, full picture of what was said, at least as complete as um, is available. And I still haven't gone through everything. So there may even be more that is found there. Um, the fact that um, the sentiment that uh, Moscow is taking our grain I mean, this is something that um, I think is a natural reaction to what was taking place at the time. If we were to look at, let's say, a situation where, uh, let's say, Canada would be forced to um, um, uh, give the United States, for instance, let's say, a certain amount of our produce. Um, and this would cause hardship in this country, then certainly we could expect, um, you know, some kind of backlash. Or if some things were being sold to the United States at a discount and Canadians had to pay more for it, then certainly we could expect a nationalist reaction. So the fact that this is being, that, that this type of reaction is taking place should not be surprising and should be seen as kind of a natural a state. What is not been taking place is that we're not paying attention, we're not paying enough attention to this. We're not paying enough attention to the fact that Ukraine was being exploited and people, even in the Communist Party, were saying, you know, look at what you're doing. You're bringing this country to ruin. The cow can't give any more milk. 
Okay, Bogdan, I would just like to ask, are, are, you, are you planning to publish uh, a paper based on this presentation? I want to, yes. Okay. We, we look forward to this paper and many more papers. First, I'd like to remind uh, uh, everyone about the film on Rhea Kleiman on the 22nd of November and the talk by Ann Applebaum on the 28th of November. The, you have information on our websites. I would like to once again thank uh, our co-sponsors, the uh, Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine at the Monk Center at the University of Toronto, the Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies, the Canadian Ukrainian Congress Toronto, and of course the Temerte Foundation that provides funding for REC. I almost every year say uh, at our Toronto annual famine lecture that this is the longest going series, continuous series on the Ukrainian famine uh, or the whole of the more. Uh, I still believe it's, it is true and it was good that uh, due to this technology, we could draw in people from beyond Toronto to join us at it. Uh, but above all, uh, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Bogdan Kleed, uh, for uh, an enlightening uh, presentation that shows what meticulous research can do uh, and bring us to new understanding of the Voldemort. So thank you very much for your presentation. And everyone join me in however you can to... to mark this and i thank you very much for your everyone for your participation this evening yeah thank you for enduring this long lecture <laughs> with a good lecture we, we, we endured it with pleasure mm -hmm. yeah.